Disclaimer. Judge Ron Rangel is providing this podcast and website for educational purposes only, as well as to give the public general information regarding topics related to the criminal justice system. The views, thoughts, and opinions of his guest speakers are the speaker's own and do not represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of Judge Rangel. All rise. You are now listening to Beyond the Gavel with Judge Ron Rangel, educating the public and expanding mindsets. Subscribe on our website, beyondthegavelpodcast.com, or your favorite podcast platform for more of the latest podcast episodes and updates. Welcome. My name is Ron. I'm your host. I'm thrilled to be here today with Marisol Morales. Now, Marisol is a licensed master social worker who's licensed in chemical dependency as a counselor. She earned her master of social work with direct practice on mental health and substance abuse at the University of Texas at Arlington. She holds a bachelor's of science in criminal justice with a minor in addiction studies at the University of Texas RGV, which was formerly known as the University of Texas Pan American. Amadi Sol holds several licenses and certifications related to substance abuse and trauma. She is currently in professional consulting with the Bear County Public Defender's Office. Welcome, Amadi Sol. Thank you for having me, Judge. I'm very happy to talk to you today. I've been working with you for a while, actually. Do you remember when I first met you? I don't know if I remember the first time, but I definitely know that <laughs> you haven't forgotten me since. <laughs> no, no. I was like, who is this person who is really fighting hard for her clients? Is that right? Now, I, I think we were on Zoom. Yes. Okay. The felony mental health PTD. That's where we first met. Uh, was at the table, came with our public defenders who were representing some of the clients in that program. And yes, I was a huge advocate at the table. We had the district attorney, the mental health court team, myself, and the local mental health providers. And we really fiercely advocated for our clients. I was able to bring the clinical perspective, but from the public defense side uh, to the table. And Yes, I made my opinions quite vocal. <laughs> yes. Judge. yes, but you were always right in what you advocated for as it related to your clients. So just so the listeners know, you no longer work in the felony mental health court with me. Is that right? That's correct. All right, let's 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 learn a little bit about who you are. Right? Where were you born? Where were you raised? I was born in a little town on the Mexican border, uh, Mission, Texas. I'm from the Rio Grande Valley. I'm born, raised. We always pictured San Antonio, the big city. That's where we go when we want to experience the big city life. I arrived in San Antonio. I've been living here since about 2000. 12. Uh, That's after I, you graduated from college? Correct. Correct. I l actually left the Valley in 2011. When I came to San Antonio, I worked in uh, for a methadone clinic, and then I went over to the center. And then I actually got hired by the county to work in the mental health court. And then one day I met Chief Michael Young from the Public Defender's Office. Let's, let's backtrack a little bit. So I used to work in Hidalgo County. I was a prosecutor there. That's right. That's right. You told me yes. In the mid to late nineties. And I grew up in Portland, Texas, which is where I lived till I was eighteen, which is outside of Corpus for those that don't know. So we got a lot of connection there. We both I ended know. up in San Antonio. So San Antonio is the place to be, right? If you're from South Texas. Exactly. This is where everyone comes to live the big city life. The and... big city, and believe me. <laughs> we growing up in Portland, Texas, it is the big city. Well, Mission, Texas. <laughs> I mean, we we were I mean, it's the home of Tom Landry. That I do have to brag about. That's where Tom Landry was born then you got mexico there and everything oh many fun memories mm -hmm. i digress judge <laughs> all right get back to business so then you came to san antonio you you talked about michael young michael young was the chief public defender here in bear county up until maybe a, a couple of months ago correct what what is it that brought you what lured you to san antonio okay so i'm going to share a little bit of a personal story from when i was a young age um I was either going to, I had my heart set on being an attorney. I want to be, I want to go to UT Austin. I was going to be an attorney. And then the path just sort of started shifting. And I thought maybe I wanted to be a parole officer. Mm -hmm. I was about law and order, black and white. If people would only do X, Y, Z, their lives would be amazing. And I want to be the one to help lead them. Well, throughout the journey of my career, things weren't always what I thought. Um, 
my brother became involved in the criminal justice system, did a lot of prison time, and it sort of started shifting my perspective on where I was going to go. How'd that work? Well, it happened in another state, and my parents were born in Mexico. So I'm a first generation American. Mm -hmm. My father became a naturalized citizen when he joined the United States Army. We were lower class. We, mm -hmm. we, we, had, we were very tight on budget. We didn't take vacations. We lived in a decent home. My father worked very, very blue collar. We did not have experience with the criminal justice system. When what happened with my brother happened, it really threw us for a loop. And that was our first real introduction to indigent defense. And this was, mind you, uh, 28 years ago. And we didn't understand the system. My mother and my aunt flew to this other state. They didn't know how to talk to the attorney. There was a court-appointed attorney. The court-appointed attorney wasn't able to answer a lot of the questions that uh, my mother and my aunt had. So mm -hmm. fast forward, I had worked at probation in Rices County. Then I was working on the court side when I got hired here for Bear County. And another incident happened with a family member. Well, how old were you the first time that your, that your brother got arrested? Uh, I was 17. And at that time, I wanted to be... A lawyer. How did that affect you? How did that impact you as it relates to your career options and the way you looked at the world? I was 17. I was immature, but it it was always in the back of my head. What, what specifically was always in the back of your head? That just your brother being in custody? and All of it. Nobody fought for him. Mm -hmm. He was honorably discharged from the military. He was working. The circumstances of what happened. Now, looking back, we could have fought something. Mm -hmm. But at the time, we didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're just following blindly this attorney telling my brother, take a plea. You want a plea or the rest of your life in prison? Which one do you want? We were completely ignorant of the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And so we thought what was best was follow the attorney's advice. So I really struggled because after I said, I don't want to be an attorney. I want to be a parole officer. I'm going to help people like my brother. You didn't want to be an attorney because you felt like somehow or another that was a negative thing? That was a bad thing? It was not a good experience. Mm -hmm. It was not a good experience for anyone in my family. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about 28 years ago, mm -hmm. and I won't ever forget that the attorney said to my mother, we don't take too kindly the gang members mm -hmm. around these parts. Mm -hmm. If you're lucky, he's getting what he's getting. Was your brother involved in gangs at that time? No. And so why do you think that was the assumption that was made? I know now. Mm -hmm. At the time, I, I couldn't put it all together. But actually, as I got older, I put the pieces together. Uh, predominantly white area. Attorney was white. My brother looked Mexican. He had a lot of Indian features. Mm -hmm. But he was a high school graduate. Um, honorably discharged from the military. Had a full-time job. Employer was very happy with him. My brother was living his life and just, and my mom told me that the attorney told her that. And I'm thinking, you don't know my brother. Mm -hmm. You don't know anything about him. You've met him twice. That to me, I, I knew something was off. Even at that young age, I thought, mm, who would say that to somebody? Mm -hmm. But in my mind, I'm thinking, okay. I won't be an attorney anymore. I won't be a parole officer. So one day I can help people like my brother mm -hmm. and hopefully help them to change their lives. Mm -hmm. Well, as I got older, reality hit. <laughs> Again, being a parole officer at that time. So we're talking a while back. Were you already in college at that time? No, I was not anywhere in college. Mm -hmm. I actually didn't get my degree until 2010. So I've had a lot of great mentors and people who believed in what I do and just opened doors for me. So I actually got into these social worky types of positions mm -hmm. without having the education. What one mentor um, could you talk about that really made an impact on your life? That would be <clears throat> Daniel. Neal. I'm always going to be grateful to him. He, I was, I was not college educated. Mm -hmm. What was your age at that time? I was 23 presenting in front of the Hidalgo County Commissioner's Court asking for a $500,000 HUD grant. Mm -hmm. Didn't know what I was doing, but he gave me the confidence and talked me through. And pretty soon I was 
doing the million dollar budget mm -hmm. at 23 with no college degree. Oh, you clearly had the passion. Though. I did. Mm -hmm. I did. And it, and it was sparking then uh -huh. because uh, we had the only homeless shelter in Hidalgo County, but it wasn't a passion yet mm -hmm. because right. I think in everybody's career, we had that humbling moment. Yes. That we'd learned a lesson, a, a hard lesson from something that happens in our career. So I was working for the employment office mm -hmm. and was very good at what I did. I worked with clients who do it, were doing welfare to work. You have to work a certain amount of hours. I always had the greatest statistics, but I forgot about the people mm -hmm. I was working with. I forgot that they had reasons why they were in my office and why they were asking for help. For me, I was like, you do your 20 hours, you're good. I meet my goal. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my job. You know, I could pat myself on the back. So that was an illuminating moment. Yes, because the worst part was one day, two back-to-back -back people asked to speak to my supervisor after meeting with me. Mm -hmm. That was an ego blow because I thought I was doing fantastic. What did they have to meet your supervisor about? They were not happy with how I was approaching them or talking to them about when they didn't meet their hours. Mm -hmm. My demeanor was a bit gruff. <laughs> I was all about the, look, you just need to listen to me. And if you listen to my plan, everything's going to work out for you. You're going to have a job. Life's going to be great. Just listen to my plan oh, I for got your it. life. Yes, I understand. My supervisor did back me up because technically I was following the rules and doing what I was supposed to do to help the clients meet their hours. But I had forgotten that these are people. Their right. mothers, their fathers, their teen moms mm -hmm. were struggling with no support. I forgot about that. You got a big heart. <sighs> I made a decision to walk away from Soul Short because by then I had already been doing it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I became a flight attendant. <laughs> really? I did. Which airline? Southwest Airline. <laughs> did you did you fly all over the country? I yeah. sure did. Very I was stationed in uh, Baltimore and then um, I moved over to Houston. But I wanted somewhere where I was. I needed to regroup mm -hmm. because I had forgotten why I was doing what I was doing. I did my sabbatical with Southwest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't have to think about clients. Didn't have to think about helping anyone. I could just greet the passengers, serve the beverages, and have a happy trip wherever you're going. Yes. Then I came back to working with children. Mm -hmm. And that really started awakening something inside of me that I had lost in those 10 years. My brother. Were you already a social worker at that time? No, I was a case manager. I was a mental health court case manager working in mental health court. I am helping the court to help people comply with their treatment so that they can stay out of the criminal justice system. It disappointed me because the very system that I was promoting to families, to people, if you just follow X, Y, Z, follow your treatment plan, follow what the court tells you, listen to the probation officer. You're going to be fantastic. And when it happened to me, it really, I said, it's hard for me to navigate this system. I can't imagine what it's like for these brothers and sisters and mothers who come and say, I just want somebody to help my child. It really, hit, it really punched me in the gut. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it punched me in the gut because I was trying to help navigate my family through this system. I work for the system. I couldn't even navigate it. Uh -huh. I couldn't get people to listen to me. It didn't matter if I pulled the, I work for mental health court. It was just unbelievable the amount of barriers that I had. And I was supposed to know the system. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, my loved one ended up in prison. And just the whole experience, it completely changed me. I'm telling you, completely changed me. What was, what was good about the experience and what was bad about the experience that had such an effect on you? The good part was that I realized what I wanted to do, my calling. Yes. Seriously, my calling. And I'd had the passion. I loved what I had been doing for years. Now I knew. I knew for certainty, I don't want to be on this side of the fence. Right. We all may be working towards the same goals, um, the state and, and indigent defense. Yes, we have similar goals, but we have very different ways of going about them. And I knew that I didn't want to be on the, specifically on the court compliance side. Right. On the, on the parole side, on the uh, probation officer yeah, side, so the pretrial services. Exactly. That, I, that was the good that came out of it because it came to me with clarity. Right. This is not what I want to do. 
Right. Mind you, this was only five years ago. Okay? You don't want to supervise. You want to help people. You want to make a difference in their lives. I want to be down in the trenches. Yes. And you definitely are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm always willing to, hey, I'll meet the client there. I have absolutely no problem. Um, so this was about five years ago. This is five years ago. And how long has it been since you've been working with a public defender's office here? About five years. <laughs> All right. So it's about when you figured it out. Yes. Okay. Because, Okay. Sometimes things happen for a reason. Mm -hmm. Michael Young, one of the public defenders, um, introduced me to Michael Young at an event. And the public defender said, this is who I'm talking about. This is wanting so. Mm -hmm. So we talked and he said, I want a social worker. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm not a social worker. I'm a case manager. He says, I want one of those because other public defenders offices are saying that it's really helpful to their offices. So I want mm -hmm. one. I'm meeting Michael Young. He's the chief public defender. I'm trying to be professional and not jump up and down and squeal because I said, what are the odds? Mm -hmm. You find your calling and then the door opens it's, up. Yeah. So, so what did you have to do to be able to meet whatever qualifications were required to be in the public that, defender's I, office? Well, I said, you know what? I need, I need to go to school to get my master's. I need that other training. I need a different skill set. I want to move it up to the next level. You liked what you were doing. Yes, absolutely. You, you, and you wanted to get good at it. You wanted yes. to get better at what you were doing. I wanted the education. I wanted the science behind human behavior. Uh, when I went to get my bachelor's, we were talking about PET scans with substance use disorders. Uh -huh. We were talking about substance use as being a bit of a moral failing and 12-step and, and higher power. Mm -hmm. When I went back to get my master's, I mean, talk about eye opener. I mean, we're talking about a, a neuroscience and how the brain works. And that's a lot of where my training came from in my graduate work. And it gave me a whole different understanding. So it sounds like you came into the practice about the same time that the justice system started to recognize all these things as a whole, right? I mean, we're talking true yes. reform <laughs> issues at the same time that you started to develop your skills. Absolutely. And I'm watching all of this happen. Uh -huh. going, this is where I'm supposed to be. And I'm getting excited because I'm I'm listening to people have the conversations, the county having conversations and, and implementing programs and um, judges and prosecutors asking questions. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm. Mind you, I had already had this, this ex these experiences. I decided to go to school, and it just gave me a much more well-rounded perspective on where people can't change. Mm -hmm. I, I used to see it, yes. but now I could connect and explain the science with the change. Uh -huh. I ended up getting hired. Attorneys, the, the public defenders didn't know what to do with me. I was, I was foreign. I'm a case manager because at that time the position was called a case manager. Um, no social work position existed within Bear County. And it was about five years ago. So the public defender's office was still in the middle of growing. Yes. There, was, there was a little bit of concern um, within the justice system as to where the public defender's office was going to fit. Mm -hmm. So there were some growing pains there, right? Yes. Um, the office had officially become the public defender's office in 2015. Mm -hmm. And I came 2018 is when I started having the conversation, when I met Michael for the uh, chief young for the first time. So that's when the growth started happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We started talking about a lot about the holistic defense, mm -hmm. which is related to best practices. It's, it's it, right. It's kind of where public defender's offices are going now. Absolutely. And it, it was very different from standard defense where you were just meeting the immediate legal need let me represent you yes right. and whatever else you have going on well that's not within my scope right now mm -hmm. um but with the model public defense moving to the holistic model social workers started actually being involved with public defense around the 1970s right and um 1971 the american bar association and the national advisory commission of criminal justice standards Angles recommended that social services be inter be 
a part of the legal profession mm -hmm. in order to provide the best representation for individuals with whatever else was going on in their life. And so at that time, the early 1970s, Max were just started to get starting to get conceived. Public defenders offices were just starting to grow. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of this came out of California. Yes. Is that right? And so and so then as it relates to your role within a public defender's office, I, I guess what you would do is you would say, how is it that I can help this person? Correct. So let's say, like, let's use an easy one, right? You have, and as a lawyer, I used to do these kinds of things. You have somebody who's charged with um, not having a valid driver's license or a license suspended. That was a class B misdemeanor back in the day. And then I would help them get their driver's license. So that's a basic. Yes. What are some of the things that you have to do within the public defender's office? For that particular kind of case, let's take a look at what else could be going on so that you can keep your license. Do you have insurance? Can you afford it? What does your budget look like? Do you have support? Do you have alternative means of transportation in case um, the situation comes up? What does your driving record look like? What can we do to uh, maybe a defensive driving course or what can we do to make sure that you keep your driver's license? And so then what you would do is not necessarily teach them how to do that, but you would teach them how to find the resources, how to do that. Both. So it's not just that they lost their license. It's what is it that got you there? Is it some sort of fear of having to deal with these kind of issues? Is it a fear of the system? Yeah. Is it a fear of, of like, like those are the kind of things that you'd be dealing with? Yes. Yes. Because ultimately we don't want you to come back for something that maybe you just need to tighten up your decision making skills or let's take maybe you couldn't pay your ticket let's look at your finances a little bit mm -hmm. we're not i mean it just leads to a whole bunch of questions something that sounds so simple social workers can very much complicate mm -hmm. <laughs> because we want to get down to what happened and how can i help you with what you want not with what i think you want not necessarily with what the court thinks you want but what do you want all right let's do a quick q a break we'll be right back this is q a with judge ron rankow submit your question today at beyond the gavel podcast.com i'm here talking to marisol morales a social worker at the public defender's office we got a question here from Steve Pena, and I'll read it for our listeners and for you, Mati Sol. Has the woke culture infiltrated and or corrupted the jury selection process? That's an interesting question, and we actually covered that in episode six with... Monica. Monica, get out of it. And, and I'm asking you because you told me right before we started that you've heard every one of these episodes. I have. I'm, I'm so happy. <laughs> so, and so the question then is is has a woke culture infiltrated and or corrupted the jury selection process. So I talked about that with Monica Guerrero. I don't think the jury selection process could really be corrupted or infiltrated uh, with a whole lot because there are so many protections that are involved as it relates to the jury selection. Um, attorneys have the right to question individuals that are on the jury panel about issues that may or may not relate to the case. They can never talk about the facts of the case themselves. They can never say, these are the facts that exist in this case, which way would you go? Because then they're committing that jury to a specific set of facts, which is inappropriate. So nobody, not even the judge, knows what facts are going to come out in the middle of that trial until the witnesses get on the stand and testify to that. So as it relates to uh, people's thoughts and their beliefs and how they feel about certain issues, uh, the jurors are, are communicated with, and as a result of their answers, if an attorney believes that that juror cannot be fair somehow to the process, either they cannot follow the law or they cannot be fair to the type of case that exists, then they can make a challenge for cause and have that person excluded from the jury panel. If an attorney cannot get that person removed from the jury panel, um, as a under a challenge for cause, then they have the right to use one of their strikes to remove that person for anything other than race, which would then create a Batson challenge. Thank you so much for asking that question, Steve.
This is Q&A with Judge Ron Rangel. Submit your question today at beyondthegavelpodcast.com. Welcome back. I'm here talking to Marisol Morales, a social worker at the Public Defender's Office. So what would be your best way to explain them the role of what a social worker does within the criminal justice system? On the public defense side, because there are social workers that work forensics, for instance, the individual, the social workers who work at the San Antonio State Hospital, mm-hmm. um, that's a very defined role. Um, and forensics means what? For, just for folks that don't know what that means. Somewhat criminal justice involved, mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess would be a real simple way to say it, because there is a difference with public defense and someone working maybe in the interest of what the state wants, mm-hmm. the state of Texas. In particular, for what I do, and you're talking like state hospitals. You're talking about uh, state hospitals. That's where a lot of forensic work comes from. Yes. Um, so forensics is more of like a like a hands on, uh, true true individual that you're working with, as opposed to merging that concept with the criminal justice system. Correct. Okay. Yes. 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 And public defense and social work are still very new, but as a social worker. Um, I was saying earlier that my role, we were able to expand. And once I was licensed, I became the social worker. And now we have two mental health case managers that I supervise. But our ultimate goal is to link people to services that Mm -hmm. will help them stay out of the criminal justice system, but also to advocate for alternatives to incarceration. So when you say services, let's say somebody who's homeless, mm-hmm. right? You help them, you help them get housing. Mm-hmm. How do you do that? We do a lot of partnerships, uh-huh. a lot of partnerships. We are very, very lucky that we have good relationships with a lot of agencies, Haven for Hope, even our Bear County pretrial um, program. We work a lot together when we see people who do not have a place to stay, we work together and what can we do so that you can have a place when you come out to jail. You work with like Cross Point, Absolutely. Oxford Houses, Lifetime, Alpha. I mean, lots of different treatment programs. Mm-hmm. But not only that, looking for boarding homes. It just depends on the need, and it's not what I think they need. Right. I think you need to be in an apartment uh, with a provider coming because you can't take your medication. It's not about what I want. Right. It's about merging what the client wants, connecting them to the types of services that they want as well as looking at their legal case. It runs very parallel. And so what kind of resources are out there in a community like Bear, in a San Antonio type urban environment? What's what's out there? Bear County does great. I mean, it really does great. I'm not native to Bear County, but I'm going to say we are way far ahead than a lot of the other larger counties in this state. Yeah, and I agree. And and, and I've seen that change, Mm -hmm. right? I've seen that since I've been, I first got elected in 2008. I've seen the change since then as it relates to the holistic uh, criminal justice system trying to make people better, mm-hmm. which in the long run really helps to to cut the underlying causes of crime. Yes, absolutely. And so how does that relate to what you were talking about? We still have far to go. This is this is this is what happens. And, the, and they're growing pains. And it's not unique to the programs here in Bear County. But we have to do what we say we are doing. It can't just be the lip service. Correct. Because everyone wants a great program. And then you got to pay for it, which is ultimately the issue, right? Absolutely. I every every run in, yes. Yeah. I mean, when, when I first became a judge, I'd be very frustrated that we would try to give people mental health assistance, but there was nothing out there that could help this particular person. So it's like, why are they on probation? Mm-hmm. We're doing nothing to help them. We're basically giving them a rope to hang themselves. We still have a long ways to go. There's always room for improvement. There's mm-hmm. always room to be thinking of new ideas, changing up the way that we've done things and getting input from people who really are in the front lines on what works and what doesn't work. What, what, what is having social workers and caseworkers involved in the justice system? Will that in the long run cut the underlying causes of crime? Will that, will that help crime statistics go down? Yes. Okay, so criminal justice system has a certain process and way of thinking. Which is what? Uh, uh, well, obviously, community community safety. Uh-huh. And public safety. P- public yes. safety. And you're not always looking necessarily 
and this is my experience, mm-hmm. you're not necessarily looking at who did what. Justice is supposed to be blind. Justice is supposed to, we've got the scales, mm-hmm. equal, lady justice, equal. For many people, that isn't true. The scales are not equal. And that's based on things like backgrounds, criminal history, where they live, their race, family support. Yes, a number. It's it's we can't just say it's just one thing. It's several things. Right. But the scales do get tipped, and Mm -hmm. they shouldn't be because she stands at an equal balance. Mm -hmm. I'm picturing her. The scales of justice. (laughs) You put a little bit of evidence on one side, a little bit on the other side, (laughs) good or bad. Yes, and and just so those that are listening know this. You actually put your hands out and did an imitation of Lady Justice. <laughs> I was very impressed. <laughs> Where's my blindfold? <laughs> so I'll give you a sword and you're in business. <laughs> now I know what I'm going to be for Halloween. <laughs> um, so, yes, we, there are other things, the criminal justice system that we really, having social workers. So you have these two different trained schools of thinking, mm-hmm. schools of training, mm-hmm. which is safety for the community versus what i mean in the long run if we if we help people become whole holistically to become better yes then it's safety for the community but what do we have to do to get there first i guess that's that's what would be the issue for a lot of people with as much as we talk about reform and change social workers are actually not the majority in working in the criminal justice system, social work. We don't have enough. No, absolutely Correct. not. Yes. So, and it's not just here in Texas or Bear County. Right. It's, it's all over the country. That places that have social workers are actually in the minor- minority um, because most don't. That's right. But so, when you allow two people to run parallel to do what they do best, mm-hmm. you're going to get a better outcome. Mm-hmm. You have a great legal mind um, who's looking. They can focus on. The, le- the, the, the legal part, the social worker working in tandem with the attorney or within the criminal justice system can help address those issues, just like you said, that will in the long run help that person not to return. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many times are we going to do the same thing over and over again? Um, and I know that it's a hard balance. I work with a lot of great judges, a lot of great district attorneys, a lot of great people in our courthouse who really, who, who want to do that. And, and I understand that um, there's a fine balance. Mm-hmm. But when you place social workers in the criminal justice system, it helps to balance that scale. And so folks know, right, we are not recording this podcast during work hours. It's pretty late in the oh. day, right? So, so I had a very long day today, right? I'm in the middle of a murder trial and I did a lot of sentences this morning. A lot of the folks that I sentenced this morning, um, whatever the end result was on each case, dealt with people that have been in the system basically their entire lives. In other words, there were juveniles that were in trouble in the law with, with the law. And then as time went on throughout the course of their lives, they went to prison for most of that time. And here they are back again. Mm-hmm. What could you do as a social worker for somebody like that? And I know it's a very broad, general question. Every, every situation is different. Everybody's an individual person. How would you approach that type, of a, that type of an issue? My first question is always, upon meeting them, how did we get here? Mm-hmm. Not how did you get here. How did we get here? Mm-hmm. And when you start to talk to people and you hear their stories, my part, my role at that certain point in their time is to try to help them address whatever underlying issues are going on. Mm-hmm. Well, there are some myths about social work, I think, that people have. Things like it's a dangerous profession. What would you respond? I have been doing this for 28 years, and I've only had one experience where I have been out in the different parts of San Antonio by myself. Mm-hmm. I have been with clients who are unmedicated and maybe under the influence in my vehicle. Um, I have worked on the Las Colonias uh-huh. um, at nine o'clock at night. And the Colonias can be. Yes, yeah. th- that's a whole other little world unto mm-hmm. itself. I've never been afraid mm-hmm. because typically I've, I've developed that relationship with the client. That's really what it's about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, even if I meet someone for that for that first time you meet a client, that's going to set the tone for the rest. You develop a relationship. Mm-hmm. 
So what does a day in the life of Mari Sol Morales, a social worker at the Public Defender's Office in Bear County, look like? So social worker working on a macro level. I went to commissioner's court this morning. Mm -hmm. um, and Probably saw some very good looking people there. I absolutely did. And we were celebrating something super awesome. Actually, I'm referring to myself. Oh. <laughs> I don't want anybody to be confused. I was talking about myself. <laughs> Because I was there too. Well, those are great boots that you're wearing. <laughs> I, I saw them in commissioner's court and I said, man, those look really cool on him. <laughs> Thank you. I like them. But that's where a social worker goes to work on a macro level. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to different directors of different departments and, and they were asking how things are going. And that's, and we're, you know me, I, mm -hmm. I'm going to speak. So it gave me an opportunity to kind of, start talking about things that are going on. So, so politics. A little bit. That's, and you were involved with politics this morning. Uh, I, I was. Mm -hmm. um, they aren't going to know what needs to happen unless they're hearing it from people on the ground, on the boots, and on we, the, boots and we, on the ground. We were in court today because, in commissioner's court, because we're celebrating the 60th anniversary of, which case? Gideon. I'm impressed. May I... Tell the short story Please. of Gideon. 1963. So we have this older gentleman, eighth grade education. He allegedly <laughs> breaks into a pool hall, steals some money. A burglary. Burglary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he ends up, he asks for a lawyer. Mm -hmm. They don't give him a lawyer because at that time you only could get a lawyer if you were charged with a felony. Am I right? Well, no. At, uh, at that time, you could only get a lawyer if you could afford it. If you could afford it. You had a right to have a lawyer if you could afford, afford it. it. And this is 1963. Yeah. Not that long ago. No, no. And here we have this gentleman, eighth grade education. Mm -hmm. okay, eighth grade education. So he ends up getting convicted. He doesn't have an attorney. He represents himself, mm -hmm. gets five years, then says this was not fair. And decides to challenge the constitutionality of his conviction. Right. Because under our Sixth Amendment, we are entitled to counsel. But it, I guess the interpretation was a little bit different than... Right. You, you, you're entitled to somebody that you can choose, that you can afford. Right. So Florida said, sorry, mm, we're going to uphold your conviction. We don't have to provide you with an attorney. The simple way of saying it. Then... He, this, this gentleman, and this is so amazing, and we looked at this yesterday, he hand wrote his writ to the United States Supreme Court mm -hmm. saying, this was unconstitutional. I should have had an attorney. And the best thing was that Supreme Court agreed mm -hmm. and said, you know what? Yes, it shouldn't just be if you can afford it or only in certain circumstances. No, everyone is entitled to an attorney if if you cannot afford it. And at that time, what that, what that court said was, if you're charged with a felony offense. So it, it, wasn't, it wasn't something that applied to misdemeanors, people that could go up to jail for, up to, for a year. Yeah. It wasn't until 1972 with Arsinger then that that was expanded to misdemeanors, and then later it was expanded to other types of defendants. That laid the foundation. Absolutely. So, so, so the 60th anniversary today was the birth Absolutely. Of the idea that all everybody who's who could go to jail, anybody who can go to jail for at least a day, has a right to have an yes. attorney. Sixty years ago, March eighteenth. It's amazing how it works. Yes. Just one gentleman who said, I'm gonna fight for this. Yes. And and he was very modest. Mm -hmm. uh, but when and when I say modest, I'm talking about uh, he came of lesser means. He was less fortunate than a lot of us were. All right. So you were so you're talking about the day. Yes. So after commissioner's court, you went back into the office. Went back into the office myself and the other mental health case manager. And it was pretty much anything from jail visits with clients to get more background information, coordinating bonds. It's not just one thing that I could do at one time and say, this is the task I will focus on. And I'm going to set my time apart for this particular thing. No, everything gets blended because there's... So many attorneys with different schedules, clients in different stages of the legal process that we have to be on our feet. Mm -hmm. So you got to multitask. It, a absolutely. Just throughout the day, I may be typing, requesting a bond, 
at the same time, I'm Skyping somebody, hey, what, can we look at housing for this person? Mm -hmm. At the same time, have another email open where somebody's asking me, this person has a warrant, but they don't know how to get to the courthouse or they don't have money. It's just constant. You're always on the go. Always. As a prosecutor, I had this experience where a lady came in, wanted a protective order. And back then, we're, you know, we're talking the 1990s. Back then, you could not get a protective order unless certain things happened to you, if you're somebody who is uh, the victim of violence. And so I had to tell her the law does not apply in your particular situation. She then goes home. I find out later that she was killed that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that was a traumatic experience for me. And I, I remember talking to the first assistant and he said, hey, there's nothing we could have done. You know, the law just did not apply in the way that she was asking for it to apply at that time. Have you ever had a similar type experience where you've really tried to help somebody? Um, and of course, I did try to counsel her at that time. I did try to uh, find some ways for her to, to be safe that evening, uh, help her find places to go to a shelter, things like that. But she ended up going back home. Is there something like that that has happened to you? that has been very impactful that you don't mind sharing with us. I, I told you I've been doing this for a while. So I've, yes, I've, I've had those experiences. I had an individual, the first, the first one that really, and because I worked in a residential facility with males. And so I saw them every day, every mm -hmm. day I would work with them. I mean, I would watch them eat. I would sit with them and eat. We would play cards on Fridays. We would have an activity. Mm -hmm. I would sit outside and hang out with them. He had an alcohol use disorder severe, mm. and he knew it. And he also had depression. I worked with him for six, seven, eight months talking to him, mm -hmm. talking to him. And the goal was eventually for everyone to move into their own housing. He didn't want to go to house his own, like, because he said, I know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Like, look, you have this support here. You can always call me. You can always call so-and-so. What's your plan? Let's get it together. Let's. Think of all these various scenarios and things that you can do or access. And we would do it while I, he was shopping for his apartment, you know, took him to Walmart and he was so excited. And, I mean, I've worked with him for so long. He's a great guy and he really tried and I, and, and he had to go. He couldn't live in the place permanently. Mm -hmm. He wasn't ready, but you know, um, he got his own apartment and visited him a couple of times like hey and he I, I could see him just immediate deterioration and he ended up passing away not even three weeks after he had his own place and he i remember we i helped him put up the curtains and putting the food in his and and sat down and he had a bought a microwave and he's like do you do you want something to eat and I'm like sure yeah let's share a meal in your home for the first time but, you know, some hope you know some yeah. hope for the future there because I could tell he was excited, but mm -hmm. it, it was just very hard to, to see somebody that I had worked with that he just became so despondent. And, and mm -hmm. it was like, I'm ready to go. And, and he did. He mm -hmm. did. He, he left on his own terms. And that was really, really hard because I wanted so much for him to be sober. And I wanted him so much to reconnect with his family. And I wanted him so much to want to live. Yes but I couldn't want those things for him. The kind of jobs that we have, and, and I certainly don't uh, put myself in your shoes. I, I'm sure you walk through shoes that have seen a lot, uh, but the kind of jobs we have can be very tough emotionally. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you handle that? How do, you, how do you find time to heal yourself? What is it that you do to make yourself feel better? I am a huge outdoor person. Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time in my yards on the weekends where I can just dump on nature, mm -hmm. everything that happens during the week and hearing people's trauma because in our field, there's a lot of secondary trauma that can happen from hearing people's stories. And I was telling my, my coworker this, I said, if you are not healthy, you don't need to commit, don't commit. Mm -hmm. Because if you are not healthy, you cannot be healthy for our public defenders and you cannot be healthy for our clients. We're dealing with people's lives who may go away for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I spend a lot of time in my yard. <laughs> Anybody that knows me knows that I am in my yard on a Friday uh -huh. from when I get home. I'm listening to the radio or I'm just sitting there. Um, I got a dog, so she's you know running around the yard. And I know this sounds strange, but 
growing up, I, my father used to make us pull weeds and we hated it. When my mom did the same. I was like, that was her job. Oh, yeah. What's going to happen on a Saturday? He's going to wake us up at seven to start pulling weeds. My mom did exactly the same thing. That's a, is that a South Texas thing? I think so. It's so, hey, it's, get up out of bed and start pulling some weeds. We got to keep that St. Augustine grass looking good. Uh-huh. So, that's right. <laughs> I am not a friend of crap grass. Mm-hmm. That's got to go. It doesn't fit with the St. Augustine grass. So, well, there's something about the earth, about the sky, the mm-hmm. sun, listening to birds, mm-hmm. just feeling the outdoors. It is really healing. It is. Well, I've enjoyed. I've enjoyed the conversation. Are there any last words, any lasting impressions that you want to leave with the listeners? I will say that things aren't always as they appear. And I think as human beings, we owe it to each other to sometimes look beneath the surface a little bit just to get a different perspective. That's all. Mm -hmm. Just look at people in a different perspective and be open to listen, Mm -hmm. even if it's a minute or two. It doesn't cost anything. One of the best experiences I have as I go through the day, as I look at somebody and if they give me a smile on their own, a natural human to human smile, nothing's better than that. Absolutely. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Well, keep smiling. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I've enjoyed talking to you. Same here. Thank you so much. I'm, I was really excited to be able to share my experience and talk to you and what public defense and social work kind of look. Oh, we're, we're really, really looking forward to hearing what you have to say, because a lot of people don't understand holistic defense they're hearing those terms but they don't really know what that means Mm -hmm. and i think you put a good color on that palette thank you so much for being here with us i've had a great time you've reached the end of our episode thanks so much for listening to beyond the gavel with judge ron rangel we'll be back in a couple of weeks you've been listening to beyond the gavel with judge ron rangel Join us in the next two weeks where we are educating the public and expanding mindsets. Head to our website, beyondthegavelpodcast.com, or your favorite podcast platform to subscribe to the latest episodes and updates.